Hi, good afternoon everyone and a warm welcome to our British Heart Foundation live and ticking event. It's just absolutely brilliant to see so many of you join us this afternoon for what I know is going to be a really interesting session on a matter so close to all of our hearts around diet and recipes. So um, I look forward to, to uh, um, speaking with you and hearing from you as well. So please do uh, give us your comments in, in the chat. We've had lots of questions already. So really look forward to having a conversation with you and sharing some expertise from across our BHF team. And I hope this finds you well as the year draws to a close um, uh, and that you're uh, um, indeed able to get some rest over the festive period. So look forward to uh, kind of reflecting on that with you or how diet and recipes might play a role over the festive period as well. Um, so please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Charmaine Griffiths and it's my privilege to be Chief Executive of the BHF. Um, and I have to say the BHF is an incredibly special organisation doing an incredible job at the moment through a really challenging year, as I know many of you will be aware. And um, I also want to take a moment to start also by thanking you all for your support of the BHF. We can only do what we do and uh, the life-saving work that we do, both our research and the support that we offer people with heart and circulatory disease because of your support. So thank you um, for that and for joining us again. So today I'm going to be um, joined by two fabulous colleagues. Colleagues, I've got Dr. Alexandra Milsom, our BHF Director of Research Relations, and Victoria Taylor, our BHF Nutritional Lead and Registered Dietitian. And they're going to be sharing with you a bit of snapshot about our research in relation to diet and, um, and, uh, and recipes, and also information and advice that you, we hope will find useful as well. And for those of you who've been to a live and ticking event before, you might know what to expect. But for anyone new joining us today, these are really lovely sessions where we love to hear from you about our supporters and share with you a bit of insight and information from our BHF team, but also take questions and respond to things that you raise that are important to you as well. So please do get engaged. We love it to, when you ask us questions and share your thinking with us. So please do use the um, chat box and sidebar to do that. But perhaps before opening up, I was going to share a few highlights from the BHF um, uh, of late um, with you. And the first I'd call out is our fundraising um, activity. So we know lots of people on these calls are fundraisers who support us in many ways. And uh, it's just brilliant to have you with us. I'd like to pull out uh, three examples of just brilliant fundraising that made all the difference for us this year and are making such a big contribution to our life-saving work. So for example, we know in August, one of our supporters, Rebecca, lost her father sadly to a sudden heart attack. And as a tribute, she's work, walking half a million steps, uh, walked half a million steps across the month of October and has raised over 1,400 pounds for our life-saving work. So huge thank you, Rebecca, if you've joined us today, absolutely brilliant. And also to Scott, who's climbing 31 peaks, a peak for every year of his life in honour of his father, who died sadly of a heart attack last year. And I think he's conquered 27 or so of those 31 already and he's, he's almost raised £1,500 himself. So Scott, thank you. That's incredible. And lastly, um, but by no means least, uh, was really touched to read the story of 41 year old dad Dean, who suffered a heart attack just weeks before the birth of his daughter. And he marked the anniversary of his survival by taking on a very special walk to raise money for the BHF. So thank you, Dean, for that really remarkable effort as well. So we couldn't do as, uh, what we do, as I've said before, without your support and the brilliant uh, um, ways in which you fundraise and find to support our life saving workers at BHF. We're also working hard to protect our research from the incredible impact that the pandemic has had on new, fun new funding and funding available for research. So uh, this has been the most challenging year in BHF 60 year history. For us, we've seen a, a drop in our net income as a, a BHF fall by over 50%. And the knock on impact of that is that our research funding budget is sadly going to drop to around, from around hundred million pounds to around 50 million pounds this year alone. And we are working really hard uh, to ask government to support that, um, the research that we fund and that pipeline of progress not just for the BHF, but for all research funded by charities um, in the UK who are experiencing the same kind of drop so that we don't stop the progress we know patients urgently need. I also want to say thank you to everybody who um, emailed their MP and joined in our campaign to uh, really show how important this move is and how important it is that we have a life sciences charity partnership fund to help us all weather this very difficult time. So thank you to everyone who supported that. 
And lastly, as you're, uh, I'm sure, preparing for the festive season, uh, I know many of us are, there are lots of ways in which you can still get involved and support the BHF. And we've got some fabulous uh, online, um, as well as in-store, stocking fillers, cards. So please do um, uh, choose to support the BHF if you can um, by using our Christmas cards and uh, stocking fillers, which you can get in shops or on our website. And also um, think about supporting the BHF if you're setting yourself a new year challenge. If you're a keen cyclist, we've got a My Cycle challenge that loads of people have already signed up for and are really engaged with. So please consider um, us in the new year as you make your commitments. And if you are a Tesco shopper um, and you have club card points, you will get the opportunity to donate uh, your club card vouchers to us. So all of those are deeply appreciated and make a really big difference in this, the most challenging of years for, for our life saving work. And lastly, I was going to share with you something that my family have done too. Um, part of the reason that the BHF matters so much to me personally and why it's such a privilege to have rejoined the team this year is we've lost many loved ones to heart and circulatory disease. And in particular, my granddad, who died in 2004 very suddenly and um, before we could say goodbye, actually. And there's a beautiful thing the BHF is doing that um, we've signed up to called the Heart of Steel, which is a, a wonderful steel sculpture that you can... Um, get someone's name engraved uh, to celebrate a moment in their lives or to honour and remember them and it's a, a beautiful uh, massive steel sculpture and as a Yorkshireman my, my grandfather would like very much that it's uh, a Yorkshire uh, a Yorkshire thing as well you get this, this beautiful uh, certificate kind of memorising um, excuse me a memorial of the person and actually on this massive sculpture can get their name engraved for um, a lasting legacy really or, or to mark a special moment in someone's life so there's lots of information about that on our website and would encourage you to have a look at that as well so um, two more things before inviting my colleagues to to share some of their thinking with you as well um, I'd urge you if you haven't already to have a look at the BHF website and our coronavirus hub for the absolutely brilliant information it contains for anybody with heart and circulatory disease who's concerned about COVID-19 and it also emphasizes ways in which people who might need cardiac rehabilitation after a, um, a cardiac event can get that and offers digital support for to help those people who might not be able to access it or feel comfortable accessing it um, in, in uh, physical form. There are digital products and services that loads of people found brilliantly helpful so please do check them out. So um, I hope that was a useful snapshot of some of the highlights of um, what's happening within our BHF team at the moment. But before we move to diet and recipes in the run up to the Christmas um, period, I might start by asking you a poll question. And I know you love these, we love seeing your responses as well. So the question I'm gonna ask you as it pops up in front of your screen is on a scale of one to five with heart five being the highest, and one being the lowest. How much do you feel you know about a healthy diet and nutrition? Let's give you a minute or two. And I'm looking to my team behind the scenes just to give me a sense of how, how that, that's going. Um, I can't see the numbers coming through just yet. So uh, I've got everything crossed. Oh, here we go. So you've shared the results now, which is wonderful. So um, actually, most of us, look at this. We're, uh, uh, most of us are around the four out of five. We feel that we know uh, quite a bit about health and uh, healthy diet and nutrition. Um, but a few of us uh, below that might feel that we might not know as much. So let's see uh, how we get on today. And without further ado, I might hand you over to my brilliant colleague, Alex, who will touch on BHF's research activity into diet and nutrition. So over to you, Alex. Oh, thanks, Charmaine, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Give me just a moment. I'm just going to load a few slides that I'd like to share with you today. And hopefully you can all see those. I'm just waiting for those <laughs> to come up. This is where I show my, my challenge with uh, technical know-how. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Sorry. A few technical issues here. Ok, 
Can you see those slides? We can. Brilliant. There we go. <laughs> so look, it's a pleasure to be here and I am so looking forward to giving you a taster of the research that we're currently funding in this area and some of the policy and public affairs activities we've been doing to make the UK a healthier place. By way of introduction, I have a background in both science and health policy. And like many colleagues you've seen during this series of events, I'm incredibly proud to say I started my career as a BHF funded researcher. And it's that pride that brings me to the BHF. I joined last year as Director of Research Relations and what a year it's been for all of us. What this year has brought into sharp focus for me is the importance of scientific ingenuity and the human endeavor. And where there's support for those two things, there is always hope in the next medical breakthrough. And that's certainly the case for heart and circulatory disease. For almost 60 years, through the generosity and tenacity of our supporters, together we've steadily invested in cardiovascular research. From supporting the human endeavour by funding scientists throughout their career, from PhD students all the way through to professors, and supporting scientific ingenuity through a wide range of research activities from laboratory experiments through to clinical trials. Collectively, we've created what is now a world leading cardiovascular research environment, an ecosystem, if you will, that all of us can be incredibly proud of. An ecosystem that has led to pioneering research discoveries that have helped improve the prevention diagnosis and treatment of many heart and circulatory diseases, saving countless hundreds of thousands of lives. So what does this ecosystem look like today? Our current active research funding portfolio stands at £450 million of investment. This means we have BHF funded research taking place at 47 institutions and universities across the country. We currently have over 800 active research projects and we fund the posts of over 1,700 scientists and clinicians. And through those other research projects support many, many more. We have so many positive achievements to celebrate. But I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the impact of COVID on our ability to fund future research. We've worked so hard to continue supporting our current researchers and their projects. But unfortunately, with less money coming in, we've had to reduce the amount of new research we would have funded this year by 50 million. It's also possible, given current circumstances, that we'll be unable to return to pre-COVID funding levels for several years. This will inevitably have an impact on this incredible ecosystem that we've worked so hard to build. So I have a plea for all our supporters out there. We need your generosity and your tenacity now more than ever, but also your positivity, your energy and your passion to enable this ecosystem to continue to support scientific ingenuity and human endeavor for another 60 years meaning together we can protect our life-saving research. Before I go on and tell you about some of that innovative research in the area, I believe we've got a second poll question. So at least one BHF funded research paper is published every six what? Oh, that's fantastic. So I've got 60% on six days. So at least one BHF funded research paper is published every six hours. 
which is quite an incredible achievement. And let me tell you a little bit more about four studies in the area of diet, which I hope you'll find as interesting as I do. And what I hope these studies show is the importance of funding early stage research, because the new knowledge it generates is so valuable for the design of larger clinical trials. So the first study involves the fascinating chemical sulforaphane, a molecule associated with broccoli and other more festive cruciferous vegetables, such as Brussels sprouts and cabbage. It's been studied for a number of years because of its ability to influence a protective signaling pathway in blood vessels. In this study, researchers from King's College London are testing whether in a condition known as gestational diabetes, so high blood pressure during, sorry, high blood sugar during pregnancy, it can protect the baby against future blood vessel damage. This is important because sadly, this condition can put both mother and baby at risk of developing heart and circulatory diseases later in life. And there's a hope that if results from this experimental model are successful, it could lead to a future clinical trial. Another good example of powerful chemicals found in vegetables is nitrate. Nitrate is involved in another important signaling pathway in the body. And when consumed in, for example, green leafy vegetables and beetroot, it increases a chemical known as nitric oxide, which in turn helps ensure healthy blood flow. This study at the University of Manchester is looking at whether increasing dietary nitrate can improve blood flow to a baby when it's developing in the womb. This is important because there's a condition whereby growth in the womb is slowed or halted, a condition known as fetal growth restriction. Not only can this sadly increase the risk of stillbirth, but it can also put the baby at greater risk of developing high blood pressure and diabetes in adult life. If this experimental study is successful, it paves the way for a clinical trial that offers the chance of a realistic dietary intervention that could improve the health of babies and mothers-to-be. The third study I want to tell you about, I like because it demonstrates how we're increasingly looking at how we can better combine the use of technology with good dietary advice to reduce our need for medication. In this study, researchers at the University of Oxford want to help people reduce their salt intake and therefore reduce their risk of high blood pressure. Interestingly, about 75% of the salt we eat is already in the food that we buy. The researchers are working with patients recently diagnosed with high blood pressure to better understand the factors which affect their food choice and then using this information to refine a smartphone app aimed at supporting healthier food swaps. They will then test this approach using a virtual online supermarket model before considering a larger scale trial. And finally, the fourth study that I've included is an example of how research can support evidence-based dietary guidelines. For health reasons, including reducing our risk of heart disease and strokes, government health guidelines recommend limiting the amount of sugar we consume in our diets. But they don't include sugars we consume from milk because we know very little about how these particular sugars affect circulating fat levels. Researchers at the University of Bath are looking at how these milk sugars are processed in people who are overweight or obese and using a special chemical tracer to track where the fat goes in the body. Along with blood tests, they'll be able to compare this breakdown process to both the sugar alternative and other sugars that the guidelines do cover. This study is important because it creates the evidence required to justify longer term studies, which in turn can inform future nutritional guidelines 
on sugars and CBD, cardiovascular disease. I really hope you found those four projects as fascinating as I do. It's not just funding for medical research though. We also have an incredible policy and public affairs team advocating and influencing to make the UK a healthier place. We hope a place where the healthy choice becomes the easy choice. This includes lobbying to change some aspects of our environment. And four examples that I wanted to share with you today include a 9 p.m. watershed on online and TV junk food adverts. So children in particular are not bombarded with constant advertisements for unhealthy foods. Clear labeling on the front of food packets with a breakdown of the salt, sugar and calories so we can all make informed choices about what we're buying and eating and improving the nutritional content of everyday foods by changing the ingredients, a concept we know as reformulation. And one example of this is our work with Public Health England to challenge retailers and manufacturers to further reduce salt levels. We not only lobby and advocate directly, but we are a founding member and funder of a coalition of over 40 leading health charities, medical royal colleges and campaign groups who are working together to influence national government policy. These are known as the, this is known as the Obesity Health Alliance. And we were pleased to see that some of the recommendations I've just outlined in this slide, including the 9pm watershed, have been adopted as part of the recent government obesity strategy announced in July. And why does this matter? Quite simply, we know eating a healthy diet and staying fit cuts our risk of developing heart and circulatory diseases. And this year has also shown that maintaining a healthy weight can lower your risk of severe outcomes from coronavirus. Speaking from personal experience, eating a healthy diet and staying fit is sometimes easier said than done. So I highly recommend visiting the BHF website for top tips. This includes the Heart Matters magazine pages for informative articles on research, nutrition and diet. They also have a healthy recipe finder, tips for staying active over winter, exercise information tailored to heart and circulatory diseases and even a festive Christmas quiz. For the family. And so it's with great pleasure that I introduce Victoria, our senior dietitian with over 20 years experience in the field. Victoria, I've got my notebook ready and I'm looking forward to some tips for staying healthy this Christmas. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, it's brilliant to be here. I am going to share my screen now. So let's all keep our fingers crossed for that. Um, please bear with. Okay, we're in. This is brilliant, it's all going well already. Um, so good afternoon. I just wanted to start, I want to say how pleased I am to be able to talk to so many of you today it's uh, the most people I think I've spoken to this year, so that's brilliant. Um, it's just a shame I can't see your faces, but one day, one day. Um, my role as a dietitian at the BHF is to help translate the guidelines that we have on diet and nutrition across the work that we do. So I've worked with our Heart Matters team for a number of years. I help to produce features. I help them to produce features, check that they're correct. Um, I also work with our press team who get requests from the media, all sorts of media about new research that's come out about food or tips and tricks for consumer magazines and, and TV programmes and things. And as Alex has already covered, I also help to support our brilliant policy team in the food policy work that they do because we really feel that that's a really important place for us to be. So, we also know that there are always a lot of questions about food and um, I've already seen some coming through, which is absolutely brilliant. It's great to get such engagement from you um, and any we don't get through today, we will use to inform our future content because it's really useful to us to know what you're interested in. 
So I'm going to get going now. Um, I want to just set the scene to begin with about what we mean when we talk about a healthy diet um, and then talk about some foods that are particularly um, linked to heart and circulatory disease that we get asked about. So things to eat more of and things to eat less of. But I'm going to start with a poll um, and to find out, well, we already know that you think you have got four out of five knowledge. So let's test that knowledge and see which of these you think is the healthiest diet for heart and circulatory health. So the traditional Mediterranean diet, a vegan diet, or the DASH diet, which is dietary approaches to stop hypertension. We'll give you a few seconds to answer those questions. I've got a feeling I think I know which is gonna be the answer, but you know, we'll see. Never assume anything. Okay, oof, here we go. Yes, that's what I thought you would say. So the top answer, 81% have said the traditional Mediterranean diet. And that doesn't surprise me at all because that is the diet that we have spoken a lot about. There's a lot of research looking at, you know, why the Mediterranean diet is linked to um, better heart and circulatory health. But actually the other diets, the vegan diet and also the DASH diet have both got some research behind them looking at you know, benefits in terms of heart and circulatory health. And I think this is the thing that we need to sort of start thinking about is that actually it's not about following a specific diet, but actually thinking about what are the dietary patterns that all of these diets have in common that make them helpful to people um, with heart and circulatory health or to prevent heart, heart and circulatory diseases. And it's that they all have an emphasis on plant-based ingredients. So whether you include meat, fish and dairy or not, um, there's plenty of fruit and vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds and oils that come from them rather than saturated fats. And when meat's included, it's in smaller amounts. The Mediterranean diet does include meat, but it's predominantly fish, the, the animal source of protein. But I think the other thing that we have to think about is about the flexibility that these diets provide. So they're not restrictive diets like, you know, some of the ones that are more kind of old fashioned ones I always think about things like, you know, the cabbage soup diet or a very restrictive sort of eating plan. Um, there isn't a long list of foods that are banned. And that's really important because it enables you to sort of weave it into the fabric of your life. So, you know, birthdays, holidays, Christmas, you know, they can all be absorbed into it. So the thing that I suppose I want people to do is find the approach that works for them within parameters. Um, and so rather than sticking on a particular diet and feeling you have to label your diet in a certain way, find what works for you that you can build into your lifestyle. And remember that there will probably always be a bit of trial and error about any lifestyle change. So allow yourself that, learn from mistakes um, or learn from when things don't go so well and then try again. Oop, here we go. And to give you an outline of what would be included in a healthy dietary pattern, keep in mind this Eat Well guide. So this is the pictorial representation of the proportions of food groups that make up a diet that would meet the UK government dietary guidelines, which are evidence-based guidelines developed for the UK population and the needs of the UK population. This again, it's a very flexible approach, plant-based, um, and it, it can be adapted whether you eat meat or not, if you have to exclude certain foods due to allergies or intolerances, but also you can adapt it to your own personal tastes, as long as you eat foods from all of the food groups, obviously. And if you get your food groups in the right proportions shown here, then actually it's a bit of like, you know, um, look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. It's kind of the other way around. If you get the food groups right and in the right proportions, and a nice variety of foods from each of the food groups, you should be set for a healthy balanced diet that provides you with all of the nutrients that you need. And you might be looking at that thinking, it's quite a long way from where, where I am now with my diet. And if you are, then you're not alone. Um, if you're not, then brilliant. Um, but actually, if we look at what 
the proportions in the current UK diet are compared to the Eat Well Guide, you can see that we do have quite a long way to go in that we're not eating enough fruit and vegetables, we're not eating enough of those whole grains and the high fiber starch carbohydrates. And instead the proportion of the fatty and sugary foods is, is too big. So we need to kind of make an adjustment there to the proportions in our diet. And a way to do that is to think about swaps. So it's not about just eating more of something or just eating less. When you take one thing out, you need to put another thing in. So for example, cutting down on things like red or processed meat and swapping in things like beans, lentils or fish would be a good swap. Bulking out dishes with extra veg. So you need less meat, but put some more veg in. Instead of chocolates, cakes and biscuits, go for nutritious snacks like a small handful of unsalted nuts and seeds or a piece of fruit, something like that. The other thing you can change is the type of fat you're, you're using for say cooking or spreading. So from a saturated fat to an unsaturated fat. This is not about low fat, which is quite sort of old fashioned advice now. It, it's about the type of fat. So we know that actually on average, we're meeting the guidelines on the total fat that we're consuming, but it's about the balance of saturated to unsaturated that we need to work on. But I think also be aware that this, there is more to this than just all of us trying a bit harder to eat healthily. This is from quite an old report now, 2007 Foresight Report, but I think it illustrates really well the complexity of factors that are influencing our food choice. Some of them are inside us, but a lot of them are also about the environment that we're living in and they all interrelate. And that's why different approaches will work different, excuse me, for different people and why it's important to take food policy seriously so that we can really make those healthy choices the easy choices. And that's the work, as Alex has said, that our policy team are doing to respond to consultations, to um, help with things like reformulation of foods, to reduce the salt and sugar content of the food that we're having, to look at the, the marketing of high fat, salt and sugar foods so that it's responsible and appropriate. And you know, making sure front of pack labels are there and that they're easy to use and that people are actually using them. But although it's dietary patterns that we are moving towards talking about generally, we're often asked about single foods and nutrients. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these that are often coming up as a query throughout my career at the VHF. I think these are our most asked questions. This year is no exception. I actually went through all of the press requests that we'd received and questions that we'd had via our helpline that have been passed to me. Eggs and coffee are the most commonly asked questions. So I'm gonna to talk to you about those, but I'm gonna start with another poll just to test your knowledge. So can you tell me what is the recommended limit for the number of eggs that we can eat in a week? Is it five a week, two to three, or is there no limit? Okay, numbers are coming in. We should be having our results in a minute. Let's see, Ooh. oof, very good. Okay, so the majority of you, or no, it's not the majority of you, 46% have said no limit, which is the correct answer, but two to three has come out 34% and five at 20%. So actually 54% of you thought that there was a restriction on the number of eggs that we can eat in a week. And I'm not surprised if with that response, and you are not wrong in that in the past, we have been restricted in the number of eggs we should be eating a week, but actually it's been over 10 years since there's been a limit and now eggs can be included as part of a healthy balanced diet. So eggs are a pretty good story, good news story nutrition wise. They're rich in nutrients, they're not that high in calories, they're quite inexpensive, good source of protein and easily absorbed in the body. But the reason we do, or we have in the past worried about them is because of the dietary cholesterol that's contained in the yolk. 
and that was why they were previously restricted. But although early studies did suggest there was an issue, actually, as that has continued as a research stream, we have now reached a conclusion or a general consensus that dietary cholesterol from the eggs, but also it comes from foods like liver and some shellfish as well, actually has a relatively small effect on our blood cholesterol. More importantly, we need to consider the amount of saturated fat we're consuming, as that will have a much greater effect on your blood cholesterol levels. So if you enjoy going to work on an egg a day, carry on, um, but make sure it's boiled, poached, scrambled without butter, and think about what it comes with. So, you know, aim for baked beans, whole grain toast, tomato, mushroom, spinach, those kinds of foods, and maybe keep the sausage and bacon for another day. Second thing is coffee. So should I avoid coffee? Um, it's another classic example of food that is often assumed to be bad, but in actual fact, that's a bit of a myth. Um, there is evidence that shows that coffee can have an effect on blood pressure, and that's possibly why people think that they need to stop drinking it. But actually, that effect is temporary and tends to lessen with time. So if you're a regular coffee drinker, it shouldn't be too much of an issue. That said, some people are more sensitive to caffeine than others. And if that is you, then obviously it makes sense to avoid or limit the amount that you have. But for most people, four to five cups a day should be fine. However, if your coffee looks like this, this, or this, then you might need to think about your coffee habit. So if it's coming with a cake or a biscuit every time, if you're into a mocha, frappuccino, latte, pumpkin spice, everything. Be aware that those will come with extra saturated fat, extra sugar. So it's not necessarily the coffee that's a problem, it's what's coming alongside it. And then the portion size that you're having as well is important. So, you know, four to five cups a day, but how big are your cups? And if you're having something like a latte or a cappuccino, that can come with a lot of milk. Now, don't get me wrong, milk is very nutritious, but you can have too much of a good thing. So just bear that in mind. If you are drinking a lot of those things, then something like an Americano with more of a dash of milk might be a better option. And then on the other side of foods to be avoided is foods to be included. And, and this probably is where um, I get a lot of requests um, in terms of media asks. You see these sorts of things in the paper on a regular basis, often in the news, there's this focus on single foods or nutrients that are really going to change your life or make you a much, much healthier person. Usually they are linked to a piece of research, but I think this is where we need to be really careful about how we interpret that research, because although it can sound really exciting, in reality, that may not translate directly into our diets. It may not be that um, it's the, the nutrient was in the food or it may not even have been in a human population. So there's lots of different things we need to consider before we start recommending these things. The other thing is that often the foods that are recommended, there may be um, a slightly more mundane source of them. So they're often looking at quite you know, exotic foods, but sometimes if it's a fruit and vegetable, those nutrients might be in a whole range of fruit and vegetables that we have in our cupboards all the time. So, you know, put some turmeric on your curry, throw some blueberries on your porridge, have some goji berries as a snack if you like them and want to try them. But really think about those things as the sprinkles on the cake, they're not the cake itself. And there are two examples where I probably should talk a bit more, particularly with the season we're coming into. Um, when I go to parties, this is mainly what people want to ask me about. Red wine, dark chocolate for, you know, they're good for me, aren't they? And I would love to say yes, but actually we need to be a bit careful with this. So there is quite a lot of research into both foods, well, food and drink. They both contain antioxidants called polyphenols, and these have been linked to benefits for heart and circulatory diseases. So far, so good. But it's also important to remember that other foods, such as the grapes that the wine is made from, blueberries and strawberries, are also sources of the same antioxidants, and they won't come with any of the negative effects of alcohol or saturated fat and sugar 
that comes with chocolate. There is some evidence that a moderate intake of alcohol can bring a small reduction in heart disease risk, but you have to balance that with the increased risk for other conditions such as stroke and vascular dementia, and the fact that alcohol is also linked to some cancers. We actually had some BHF funded research published in 2018 that looked at the effect of alcohol consumption on heart and circulatory diseases. And that concluded that the risks of alcohol really do outweigh the benefits. So definitely don't drink wine to protect your health. And if you do drink alcohol, don't exceed the 14 units a week that's recommended as a maximum, not a target. And if you do drink that much, make sure you spread them out because actually the drinking pattern is important as well. We know that binge drinking can increase your risk of heart disease and stroke. And when it comes to chocolate, uh, generally speaking, the higher the cocoa content, the higher the content of the polyphenols. So that's why you do hear that dark chocolate will be better for me. Um, I would still not say chocolate is a health food, even the higher cocoa content um, chocolates will still come with quite a lot of saturated fat and sugar unless they're 100% cocoa. Um, and so I would say with chocolate, have some now and then, enjoy it, but um, choose the chocolate that you like rather than um, eating it for the polyphenols. And given that it is this time of year, we've all touched on it, I'm gonna go get in a bit deeper to Christmas, healthy Christmases now. Um, but starting with the final poll of this section, which is going to focus on Brussels sprouts, an integral part of all of our Christmases, whether we like it or not. So how many Brussels sprouts do you think we need to eat to, eat, to meet our daily requirement of vitamin C? Is it 12 to 14, nine to 11, six to eight? You've all performed extremely well on these polls so far. So let's see if we can make it the hat trick. What have we got? Oh, yes, you win again. So yes, 54% of you have said six to eight and that is correct. Six to eight boiled Brussels sprouts is the equivalent of an 80 gram portion and that will provide you with 48 milligrams of vitamin C. Um, our requirement is 40 milligrams a day. And although we hear a lot about Christmas and how bad it is for our waistlines and our health in general, I think we have to take a moment to just commend our traditional Christmas meal because there's a lot of benefit to it in terms of, of our nutrition. It's, it's not a, an unhealthy meal per se. Um, it's often also a time of year when people eat more fruit and vegetables than they normally would. So don't forget, it's not, it doesn't just stop at the sprouts, get stuck in with the parsnips, carrots, red cabbage, dried fruits, satsumas, oranges, they're all part of the season as well. When it comes to the big day, itself I would say enjoy it. It's one day in the year. Christmas is centred around feasting and food and being with people as much as we can um, and so it's it's to be enjoyed but it's really about the, the bit before and the bit after where you can end up eating up all of the leftovers and all of the kind of you know food that comes before. Many of us are having smaller celebrations this year as well. So remember to factor that into your shopping so that you're not left with loads of leftovers that you have to clear up afterwards. And to help you get back on track, know that we have our recipe finder online. There's over 300 recipes on there, but we do have some that are specifically designed for Christmas, including a really nice turkey pie recipe, which uses up all of the leftovers in a, in a healthy way. So um, hopefully one of my colleagues will be able to put the link up on the sidebar in a minute so you can have a look at that if you're interested in it. I'm going to stop talking in a moment, but just summarise what... Ooh, stopping myself, just summarise what I've been saying really, which is that all foods can be included in a healthy balanced diet. We just need more of some than others. There are no superfoods or nutrients, just a super diet is what we're looking for. So take a whole diet approach to your eating rather than focusing too much on individual foods and nutrients. 
find the approach to eating well that works for you. And that should mean that you can have a sustainable way of eating that means high days and holidays you can just flow with. Um, and finally, if you want to know more about food, we've got, I mean, it's, there's so much I could say, but I haven't got time and I have to stop talking so that you can ask your questions. But Heart Matters has a, a huge range of information that um, you, can, you can really delve into. And um, it's a great community to be, to be part of. We've got magazine, there's, yeah, there's hubs and specialist areas about all sorts of things. Um, you can write in and ask your questions and we will answer them. So please do sign up. There's a link on our website if you are not a member already. But thank you very much. And I think it's time for your questions now. So thank you, Victoria, for such a fascinating presentation and Alex for giving us that snapshot of BHF research and its link to diet and nutrition. I, I don't know about you, but I'm really glad that I can eat as many Brussels sprouts as, as Victoria's just advised as well. And I know how interested you have all been because we can see all the questions flooding in. Um, I, I can see also that Victoria's already addressed brilliantly some tips and advice for Christmas that were so important to so many people as well. But we want to make sure we've got some good time for your questions now. So I'm going to hand over to Christy, our moderator, who's going to call a few out. And you've got our commitment that if you've asked a question today, we'll definitely get back to you, even if we can't cover it off now. So over to you, Christy. Open us up on questions. Great. Thanks, Charmaine. We've had some fantastic questions. So thank you, everybody. The first question is for Victoria. And it is, are any cheeses good for a healthy heart? And how much should or can they be consumed, say, on a daily basis? Okay, great question. Very topical as well, because dairy is an area of research that is growing. Um, we know that, um, so if you look at the Eat Well Guide, dairy is a section in there. Probably about two to three portions um, a day is what's required to meet your calcium requirement. Um, and that's the equivalent of a third pint of milk, pot of yogurt, or some cheese. Now I've got here, I did, this is a pre-submitted question, so I do have a visual aid. Um, this is, I don't know if you can see that, a 30 gram, oops, 30 gram portion of cheese, which is, I might just hold it up because it's my own cheese. So it's a, um, a matchbox size piece of cheese, which is a small matchbox size. So that's the first thing with cheese because it is nutritious, it does contain calcium, but it also is higher in saturated fat and salt than other um, dairy products. So keeping your portion smaller is better. Um, the types of cheese, we've got a, um, a piece online that's gonna be linked up in the sidebar, which actually looks at the good, the bad, the ugly cheeses. So there will be a difference depending on the type of cheese you are choosing in terms of the amount of saturated fat. So the lowest fat cheeses are going to be things like a low fat cottage cheese or a low fat cream cheese. Um, and the highest fat is going to be something like a Stilton. That's your kind of continuum of cheese, I suppose. If what you want though is a cheddar cheese, a hard cheese, then I would suggest going for a reduced fat cheddar and choosing a mature one so that you get a stronger flavor to it. And then you can you know, still enjoy the cheese you like, but with a smaller amount and, and less saturated fat coming with it. Now, the other thing with this 30 gram portion is that it can seem quite small to a cheese lover. Um, but the other thing I've also done for you is I've actually grated, ooh, can you see that? I've grated a 30 gram portion there. And what you can see is, let me do one side by side, it actually Now, I don't know if this is a cheese presentation that's interrupted the audio, so bear with us. That is another, welcome back, Victoria. We lost you for a couple of seconds, but uh, I think we got the point that the, you showed us exactly what the cheese looks like grated another, and I, I found that really useful, so thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Victoria. We have a, another question, um, which is a great one. Could you give us some advice on healthier mid-afternoon snacks to go with tea instead of reaching out for a few biscuits? Yes. Biscuits are um, really easy to grab. They're just in the biscuit tin and that's, you know, probably why we eat so, so many of them. 
so think about, I suppose, how you um, choose your, you know, or not how you choose biscuits. It's more about the ease of getting a biscuit and think about other foods that you can make just as easy to grab when you're having a cup of tea. So an idea could be you could have a jar of unsalted nuts or dried fruit on the side and have those instead of a biscuit. Um, you could also try things like um, an oat cake with some reduced fat um, cheese spread. You could try um, oh some uh, a low fat hummus with some vegetable crudite, so strips of um, cucumber, carrots, peppers. I think the thing is though is that that's going to be harder to prepare than getting a biscuit out of the tin. So think ahead and this is a lot of, of what you need to do with healthy eating is really uh, prepare ahead and plan. So if you know you're always going to have a cup of tea with a biscuit in the afternoon, Monday to Friday, let's just say, um, on a Sunday, chop up your vegetables and put them in the fridge so that they're ready to go. And then it makes it much easier to fulfill the plan of having that healthier snack with your cup of tea. I would say though, I mean, I can see that if what you're looking for is a biscuit, a hummus and dips may not be fitting the bill. So the other thing is that we do also have on our recipe finder some healthier cakes that you might want to try. Um, we've got a really nice tea bread, there is a carrot cake, a healthier carrot cake, and we've also got some healthy mince pies. So they might also be something to try. Again, prepare ahead, make them at the weekend, and then you can eat them during the week. Great, thanks Victoria. Uh, another question that's come through um, is what foods are recommended for people who are in the pre-diabetic range in order to avoid heart problems? And what is the connection between diabetes and heart disease? So it's really um, important that if you do have, um, if you have been told that you have impaired glucose tolerance, that you're pre-diabetic, that you are, um, you know, Borderline, you have borderline diabetes, it's often called lots of different things, but essentially means the same thing that you are at greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And there are things that you can do to actually prevent that from happening or to slow down the speed with which that happens. So what I would um, suggest is that you really need to use it as a call to action to improve your eating habits. So really getting that eat well guide, making that your Kind of standard way of eating and then also get active be more physically active and look at about your weight um, hopefully if you're more active and you're eating well you should help to reduce your weight so that's what i would suggest for that the link between um, diabetes and heart and circulatory diseases is that it is a risk factor for heart and circulatory diseases so if you have type 2 diabetes you are at higher risk so it really is important that you do um, address that before it happens. It's always easier to sort of prevent something rather than to deal with it once it's happened. Thanks, Victoria. And we've had a, another question come through um, from uh, our, our live session just now. So a question for Alex. What are the top three research themes um, across BHF funded projects? Oh, thanks, Christy. That's a great question. So, our funding streams are open across all areas of cardiovascular research and associated risk factors. But of those 800 projects that I mentioned in the slides, if you did look at the um, highest number of awards by disease area, we do have the most research awards at the moment in heart failure, heart attacks and atherosclerosis. But that does change year on year. And we do have some fantastic infographics about that, um, both on our website and in our annual report. Thank you, Alex. We have another question for you, Victoria, before I uh, hand over to Charmaine. So is a, a vegan diet healthy for someone with heart failure? I'm attempting to become vegan, but there seems to be a lot of recipes involving peanut butter, cashew nuts, and maple syrup. <laughs> Yes, good question. Very topical. More and more people are wanting to move towards a, a vegan diet now or somewhere in the middle, a sort of a, a flexitarian diet is the latest thing. Um, I'd say we don't have evidence specifically for heart failure and a vegan diet. We do know that plant-based diets in general 
um, can be beneficial for heart and circulatory diseases. So it is in line with that sort of dietary pattern. Um, what we also know though, is that a, an unbalanced vegan diet is of no more benefit than uh, an unbalanced mixed diet. So it just being vegan doesn't give you that benefit. If you want to balance it well, you need to make sure you've got all of the food groups and think about, I mean, the thing with meat, you can eat a healthy balanced diet without meat and animal products, but you need to think about the nutrients that those foods put into your diet in the first place and replace them with plant-based alternatives. You do also need to pay particular attention in the long term to things like B12 and iodine. Um, and talk to your, your doctor about supplementing those. Um, in terms of the, yeah, the, there has been a sort of a, a, a more of a growth in terms of the vegan diets. And so um, the other thing to watch for is the, exactly as you've said, the kind of high fat salt sugar foods that are, you know, it's a marketer's dream. So um, be aware that vegan doesn't equal healthy. Um, and so do still look at food labels and check that the foods that you're trying are actually overall healthy as well as being vegan. Thanks, Victoria. Fantastic. And our last question is for Charmaine. Um, how has COVID-19 affected the BHF as a whole? And we, we've touched on that, but what can we do to help out? Oh, well, thank you to whoever asked the question. Um, you, as I said at the start, we can only do the life-saving research that Alex touched on and provide the support that Victoria has given us a glimpse of today because of your support. And whether you choose to donate uh, your pre-loved goods to one of our shops to buy your Christmas cards with us or have a loved one engraved on the Heart of Steel, you're doing your part to support us. So I want to say again, thank you for everything you do. You're a huge part of our VHF family as our supporters and we need you, so thank you. Um, in terms of the impact uh, that COVID's had on the BHF, in short, it has been the biggest um, challenge that BHF has faced in its 60 year history. And our British Heart Foundation team have done a remarkable job at navigating the challenge with your support. So uh, I'm a uh, huge credit to the team. I couldn't be prouder of them and I've asked more of them over the last year. And I, I guess, um, uh, perhaps if I can, I might draw this uh, session to close actually by asking a couple, one more thing of you. We're gonna ask you a couple more questions just before we wrap up. So we're gonna ask you two more poll questions. So the first one is, again, on a scale of one to five, we're gonna ask you, how much do you feel you know about nutrition now? You've uh, heard today's talk. Let's have a look at the numbers. It's always exciting this part and you guys have done so well you've you've uh, as you said got uh, got victoria's questions completely right so very impressive let's have a look at the answers fabulous so i can't see them oh here we go there we go it took a moment thank you so about uh jim got a bit of movement there more people moving up into the four and five range feeling we know a little bit more together about it and i hope we've had some ideas and inspiration with thanks to victoria for our christmas uh, plans and preparation as well as all those new year's resolutions that we we often make and uh, making that simple choice easy is something victoria names and I, I hope we've given you a sense of the amazing range of resources that are available on our vhf's website uh, whether that be recipes or information about your heart health so please do take a moment to check out after this as well. And then last question for you, if we can, could I ask you just to share with us, we won't publish this result, it's just for us, but has this event increased your likelihood of supporting the BHF? So we'll give you a minute just to re respond and give us a, an answer and we'll keep that for ourselves, but really helpful for us to know so we can make these events as useful for you as, as they are for, for us and enjoyable as they are for us. Thank you for that. So just to wrap up, I'd just like to thank you again for joining us at this Live and Ticking event. We love them. We love hearing from you and we can see from your questions how um, important and, and interesting the subject of diet and nutrition is for you. It is for us as well. And uh, we will be sending, as I said, all of your answers to your questions we didn't get time to cover today back to you. So please do watch out for, for those. We'll also be asking you to complete a survey that helps us make sure that we give you um, what's interesting to you as part of these sessions and we learn from them together. So if you could take a moment to do that as well, it makes a really big difference to us and the VHF team. 
And also please watch out for the next one of these events, which will be taking place in um, January. It's the first one in January. It's on the Wednesday, the 20th of January, between four and five in the afternoon. And again, we're going to be joined by fabulous colleagues from my BHF team um, who work on our heart helpline, who will be uh, present to help answer any questions or queries you might have about heart health or cardiovascular health. So um, please do put that in your diary and, and sign up for the next one. And then share, uh, if you've enjoyed today, share share it with your friends and colleagues and, and, and family too, and encourage others who you think might find this useful to join us. And uh, lastly, I'm just gonna wrap up by wishing you the very best of festive wishes. I hope uh, you and yours have the very best of, of a break and some time together where you possibly can over the festive period and very much look forward to seeing you again in 2021. So thank you for all your support, everything you do for the BHF and take care. <laughs>